the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. He was, he is, and always shall be. Today is the celebration of all saints, which is the commemoration of all the saints. And we have um, the gospel reading always goes in accordance with the celebration that we have during the year. But today in the, the epistle reading, we hear, it's, it's always interesting how the two the epistle and the gospel reading dovetail together. And I just wanted to take a minute to talk about the epistle reading that we hear this morning from the letter of uh, St. Paul to the Hebrews, where he speaks about the, the, the variety of saints and the variety of, of those who have followed God. There's been those who have, as he said, through faith, they conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, received promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women who received their dead by resurrection. And then he, he talks about those who are victorious saints, and then he talks about the ones who were tortured, refusing to accept release that they might rise to a better life, others who suffered mocking, scourging, and even chains and imprisonment, others who were stoned, sawed in two, killed with a sword, went about in the skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering over deserts and mountains and dens and caves and of, of the earth. All these, and now he's talking about all these, the, the ones who were victorious as well as the ones who were afflicted and tortured, well, though well attested by their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had foreseen something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So what is he saying? He says that if you do these things and you're still away from God, nothing's going to happen to you. No, there's, you're not going to receive the reward of the kingdom of heaven. You have to have those either achievements or those sufferings tethered together with your understanding and your relationship with God. That in suffering, as St. Paul says, comes perfection. But in suffering can come destitution too and, and complete and utter loss of a person outside of their faith. So you see sometimes people, when they have something that's wrong with them, they have a, an affliction, they can either do one of two things. They can either become closer to God or they can become further away from God. And there's really, um, I, it, in my ministry, I've rarely seen people who kind of just stay in the middle. It's either they go one way or the other. It's either they, they turn that suffering into something extraordinary and ultimately die um, as we all will, will with a, with a growth that, that came through their suffering or they stagnate and they go the opposite way and they, they fall away. But St. Paul says in, in this letter to the Hebrews that there's, there's this wide variety of saints and we see that in the church. We see it on the icon screen. We have St. Nectarios the healer. We have Archangel Gabriel who who speaks um, throughout history, St. John who proclaims Christ, we have Christ himself, the Virgin Mary who need no explanation, St. Athanasius who's a writer, Archangel Michael who's a fighter, and St. George who is an endurance um, saint. So we have all these different saints and they all have stories. Some were tortured, we have martyrs that we celebrate today, the martyrs in China who were martyred for their faith. We have those who lived um, as, as kind of the model of of the writings of the, the saints in the church, if they had a peaceful life, they had a, a tragic death. If they had a tragic life, they have a peaceful death. So we have like St. Athanasius in the back who was exiled five times in his life, ends up dying in peace. You have St. Nectarius who had a bunch of problems in his life with false accusations, ends up dying in peace. You have other um, saints in the church who, who had these peaceful lives and end up having these tragic ends, um, even as Christ is the, the prime example for that. So we have this example of St. Paul saying what the different um, paths to sainthood are, but all those paths have to be coupled with um, the connection with, with Christ. And then he says in the next part that in the gospel that there's a specific way that we have to follow Christ. We have to follow him by denying ourselves, taking up our cross, following after him, but we also have to leave things behind in order to follow him. 
And he says, you know, if you're, if you're not willing to leave your father and mother, if you're not willing to leave your house or your, your children, then you're not worthy of me. And then Peter, St. Peter says, um, well, we did all those things. Well, what, what are we going to have? What is the, what's the end game here? And not knowing, saying that out of, out of innocence and, and ignorance of the full plan of God, he says, well, what, what's in it for us that we've done all these things? What, what are you going to do? at the end. Not kind of what do you owe us, but really what, what's going to happen with us. And he says, Christ says that if you've done these things, you receive it a hundredfold. So we have the understanding not only of, of Christ calling us to say that you have to abandon certain things. Now, that doesn't mean just get up and walk away from your family, so don't take that the wrong way. But if those things outweigh your ability to focus on God, then it's a problem. Then you are denying God because you are too clinged, uh, clung on to um, something else. So how do we explain this fully? If your job takes precedence over your faith, if family takes precedence over your faith, if, you're, if you don't step up and say, all right, how, how would family do that? You might have a family member who says, I don't understand why you go to church all the time. You don't need to do that. You don't need to follow God. Just do whatever. Just you know, follow this or follow that. And then what? Then the person goes astray. And then Christ says, hey, you were supposed to love me more than everybody. And if we don't have God as our, our first love in our life, then we cannot even begin to love one another or ourselves. That's why in the marriage service, in the, in the wedding, in the Orthodox uh, service, the, the couple has, their hands are joined together by the priest saying that the hand of God comes down and then the gospel separates them at the end to put their hands down by their side to remember that without Christ in the middle of the couple that there is no marriage, that it dissolves. And we see that throughout so many lives that without Christ in the middle, there is, there is no love. So you cannot love yourself, you cannot love your spouse, you cannot love your job, you cannot love your talents, you can't love anything if God isn't the first love in your life. And that's really what the gospel and the epistle are saying today, that despite whatever you do, if you conquer in, in battle and you're victorious, if you don't have God as the reason for your conquering, you're lost. It's a futile battle. If you fast and you don't have God at the end of your fasting and understanding why you're fasting for God, then it's just a, a ridiculous exercise. If you don't have God at the forefront of your, of your heart and of your life and what you're doing in your life, then you will never, ever be able to properly love yourself, to love others, or to even understand how to love the church because Christ is the church and the church is Christ. And we have to understand that those, Christ gives himself up for the establishment of the church. So anyone who says, well, the church isn't important is really saying that Christ isn't important. And if we feel that, oh, church is just the same thing all the time or it doesn't, do anything, then we're saying, well, Christ is the same thing and he doesn't do anything. So the gospel reading today tells to us that in the new world, when Christ sits on the throne, those who have given up things in this world will receive a hundredfold. And he tells the disciples here too, which is interesting, um, is kind of a fullness of understanding for them. There's 12 disciples and there's also 12 tribes of Israel. If you go back into the the history of the Old Testament, you'll see that there's 12 different tribes. And there's, what is that, you know, specifically? Well, there's 12 different groupings of, of people. Now, who's to judge them? The 12 apostles are to judge them. Ultimately, 12 is the complete number. As we see, there's 12 months in a year. Um, we have the 12 disciples. That's why when Judas betrays Christ, there's 11. And they're like, that's not going to work. He wanted 12. So they appoint Matthias, who was there from the beginning, as the 12th disciple. Many times you'll see St. Paul is depicted as the 12th disciple. Um, but the reason is that there's that complete number. That the, the disciples who become apostles will be the ones to sit next to Christ to judge the world. And really, how, how can they do that? They have to have... Christ at the center of their life, they have to give up everything um, and to move forward. But, you know, St. Peter was one who, who asked this question, what do we give up? But yet, 
his wife was following along in the 70. There's the 12, the group of the 12, and then there's the 70, who are the other um, followers of, of Christ, too. And his wife, and there was other family members who were following along, too. They're just not called the group of the 12. So to give up, um, where Christ says to, to give up family members or those types of things, it's really to just prioritize and say that God, anything that comes between you and God has to go. And if it's a family member, it has to go. If it's a job, it has to go. If it's a way of life, it has to go. And even if it's a spouse, it has to go. Now, I'm not endorsing uh, divorce, but what I'm saying is that if your life doesn't work and you can't get closer to God and there's something broken, you got to fix it. And that has to, that has to be uh, worked on. Now, many times in, in, in marriages, we have to, you know, work to, to, to make the couple grow together to Christ, but sometimes it just doesn't work. And sometimes what we've chosen as a career path just doesn't work. And sometimes what, who we've chosen as friends doesn't work. Or where we live, or how we act, or what we do to ourselves, or how, what we don't do for ourselves just doesn't work. And the gospel today says, if you want to be a saint, which we all should have that as the priority for our lives, if you want to be a person who gets closer to Christ, you have to make sure that there's nothing in your life that doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, it's got to go. It's kind of like saying, um, you know, they, they have that phrase that if, uh, you know, one uh, apple in the bunch kind of ruins everything or um, one little rotten piece of fruit can ruin everything. Well, it's kind of like our, our lives, too. You know, you think if, if you were um, here in church and you're looking down at your finger and your finger's black, it's completely black, and you're like, I don't know why that is like that. What do you think is going to eventually happen if you have necrosis in your finger? It's going to spread, right? We know that from people who have diabetes, they're, you know, with a foot or whatever. And what do they have to do? They have to cut it off to stop it from spreading to the rest of the body. For those who had... Uh, in the war and they had gangrene or and serious infections, what do they do? They amputated to stop the infection from spreading. Christ tells us just the other day in the gospel reading that if something causes us to sin, we have to cut it off. If it's our eye, we have to pluck it out. Now don't go plucking your eyes out or cutting your hands off. Transfer that into something else. I don't want to see, you know, get a bunch of hospital visits next week of one-eyed, one-armed, flying purple people eaters or whatever. Um, but you have to look at your life and you have to say, what is it that I need to get rid of? And that's what the, the, the epistle is talking about, the gospel is talking about. And the only way that we can really grab onto God is if we don't have those weights pulling us down. You know, uh, I, I remember uh, one writer and, and uh, professor would always say, the, the door to the kingdom of heaven is very narrow. And you can't get through... If, if you're a glutton or if you're carrying things, you'll never fit through the door because it's narrow. You have to drop everything to get through. Sometimes you've got to suck your gut in and you've got to slide in, but that door is narrow. You can't take the baggage of sin. You can't take your material wealth. You can't take gluttony in life and fit through that door. You have to let it all go. And the only things that will help you get through that doorway is that connection with God and that drive to say, you know what, I want to be there. I want to be with God. You know, it's, with the Olympics are coming up and you read these, or you see the stories of, of the Olympians. I always enjoy that. And you say, this, you know, they have this kid or whatever, an example story, this kid who is two years old and he's, you know, doing shot put or whatever, or, or doing some kind of sport from like this early age and they show video of this, you know, kid doing whatever and and every day for like eight, ten hours, that's all they do. That's all they do is, is that sport. You know, I remember when Michael Phelps was, was the, uh, you know, kind of the talk of the town in, in the Olympics, and they showed all those, you know, biographies of him on, on TV, and, and he swims all the time, and he eats like 80,000 calories, and they showed his breakfast, and it looked like, you know, like the garbage can at McDonald's with all this food, and, and that's all he did. Why? So he could be the best swimmer. But then when we think of our relationship with Christ, we say, well, what are we doing for our relationship with Christ? Do we have that same drive to say, you know what, we're going to do this all the time? The monastics, we see it, they leave everything and go pray all the time. What are we doing? 
I'm not saying we have to abandon our way of life to go pray all the time in, in a monastery, but we definitely have to abandon the things that pull us down and focus on prayer every opportunity that we have. Otherwise, how do we expect to be Olympians of Christ? How do we expect to be victorious? Or as St. Paul says, to be victors in, in, the, in the good fight, to fight the good fight. How do you fight if you're not trained? How do you defeat evil if you're not strong? How can you do any of that? We all know from surgeries and different things, what do you do? You, have, you get out of your surgery, you come out of your surgery, and then what? You have physical therapy. And if you don't do physical therapy, you get people yelling at you. Sometimes it's your family members. Most of the time it's your doctor, right? If you don't lift your arm up after the rotator cuff, you're never going to be able to you know, pull a uh, dish off the shelf. So you got to do that. You hate doing it, but you do it. And then eventually, at the end, you look back and say, man, I'm glad I did that because I can move my arm or I can move my leg or whatever. It's the same thing with our life with Christ. We have to continue to struggle so that when we get with Christ at the end of our life and, and we're embraced by him, we say, you know what? I'm glad I did all those exercises, those spiritual exercises, because now I'm here. And yeah, it was hard. It was difficult. It was, you know, sometimes I was embarrassed to... To, to pull away or do my cross in public or whatever the stories are that we might have. Whatever it is, when you're in the embrace of Christ, you're going to be thankful for that. And if we don't do those things, then he, what does he say to us? If you deny me now, he will deny us later. So let's not be deniers of Christ. Let's be strong. Let's be energetic and, and try and push forward each and every day so that we can be listed uh, someday on this beautiful Sunday of all saints. Amen.